All right. Good morning. 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 Still sleepy? Good. That sounds good. Okay. So uh, BCC is back. Business Cup Challenge. Are all of you familiar with the BCC? Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> Seems like I'm the only one. All right, we'll move to the next. Okay, I'm sure all of you have read this, the blah, blah, blah. My whole point of coming here is of those two arrows, the finest students and the brightest business ideas. That's precisely why I'm here. And, uh, well, I would like to be a part of the brightest and the finest, right? So that's, that's the whole point. I'm going to try and not bore you too much, but I've got a yawn meter with me, which actually counts how many yawns you're going to come up with by the end of the presentation. So hopefully, it's not too many. Right, so that says, why are we here? First line, very simple, to have a brief introduction on blockchain and uh, to not get bored, yawn. So let's talk about the brag time. That's me. Those are my credentials. I'm going to give you a 15 second to read through. And mind you, except for the MS, which I did in my college days, the rest of the qualifications I've done uh, pretty much in my mid 40s. So it's just a passion that I like to study. And blockchain and Bitcoin are the current trends. And I think you know, that's where the world is headed to. Right? As you see the last part of it, I'm actually mentoring a cohort team for a future accelerator program. Now, that's with the NYU AD where I've got a couple of teams and we're trying to come up with an app which is going to be deployed on the Emirates Airlines and the Etihad Airlines blockchains, right? I can't talk much more about that, but that's the basic information. Okay, can someone tell me what this picture actually says? Okay, I like people to talk. Let's not make it a very boring me talk, you listen type. So can someone come up and say what this picture actually talks about? Anyone? No one? Right. Does, does this actually indicate a blockchain? Why not? OK. Good point. What else? Right, so two people does not qualify to be a blockchain, is that what you're saying? Okay, makes sense, perfect. Right, so basically what he's saying is that this is just depicting two people and that's really not what blockchain is all about. And that's quite perfect. Blockchain is a lot about multiple people, probably millions. Right, so I'm going to give you a very simple textbook definition of a blockchain, okay? It stands for, blockchain is a wrong word, to be honest with you. It's really not called blockchain. It's actually, in the right technical terms, it is called as the distributed ledger technology, right? How many of you know what's a ledger? Speak, speak loudly. Good. Anyone else? What's a distributed ledger or what's a ledger? This side seems to be quiet. A ledger? Okay, a ledger is a book. As he rightly said, the ledger is a book to keep records, right? So what are we doing? We're basically maintaining records. Records could be of any kind, birth, death, money, gaming, uh, what kind of clothes you like, what kind of ice cream we like to eat. So it could be practically anything. So that's a ledger, right? So when we say it's a distributed ledger, what we're really talking about is one huge, massive ledger book 
which is not kept with a individual, but it's actually practically kept with anyone and everyone. That's what blockchain is about, right? A blockchain is defined as a digitized, decentralized public ledger. Now that's really, again, a textbook kind of a definition. Let's make it very simple. Blockchain is nothing but a digital record, a digital transaction, which is actually maintained at some point of a server level in where the servers are really not existent, but it's maintained on a particular computer, which is called as a peer or a node, right? So where the, tra the individual records are maintained and all the transaction, a transaction or multiple transactions are kept and maintained, and all of these eventually get linked into what we call as a block. So these links, when they, with these blocks, when they're chained together, it becomes a chain of blocks, which is simply a blockchain. So if you look at the right, the picture at the bottom, each block is basically representing a transaction, a data, a set of data, which eventually gets linked to the other set of data, right? And that, the whole chain really creates what we call as a blockchain. All right, I like to call this as the old man model. If you see the picture on the right hand corner, what does it indicate? It indicates an old man. Does that mean that the man is bad? Absolutely not. The man has served his purpose. He has done his job. He had a particular model, which we all liked, which had worked. That was good then, right? So let's look at it from the computational point of view. What does it mean? The pre-blockchain is what we would call it. It is a traditional transaction. All of you guys are high school students and have ICT as a subject. You definitely know what a client server query and push and pull is, right? So given that situation, that's the old model of transaction, which is the client server processing back to the server, back to the client. So it's a query. Now, when that happens, the transactions are delayed and restricted. So we have to depend on a certain server. What if the server fails? What if the server decides to have a holiday? What if the server says, you know what, it's not my time. I'm not in the mood to do work, anything like that. So we've got issues. What if somebody hacks into the server? Now, these are typical scenarios which have happened as we speak, which are happening as we speak. You know, we've got situations where emails get hacked, which is again the old system. We've got situations where bank accounts are hacked, which is again the old system, where we're talking about the typical server security. So it's high risk. The current model, the old man model, let's call it that way, is in high risk, right? Server downtime is an absolute reality we all have faced at some point of time in our life. We're trying to log on to the mail. It just doesn't log in. The server's down. We get an error 404 message or we're trying to find a particular page, it's not there, it's taken off because someone at the server level is controlling it, right? So what is happening here? We are completely dependent on the servers. So if there's a server downtime, we have an issue. It's high maintenance. Huge amount of servers need huge amount of space. Does anyone know where the Google servers are located or the Yahoo servers are located? Anyone? Okay. These servers are pretty much maintained in very remote locations. For example, in the UAE, we have certain servers sitting in the deserts of Alain. Why? Because it is cheaper. Secondly, it is because we have a fantastic network of the optical cables out here in the UAE, which allows us to keep the servers on a very remote basis. But that's what the old, ma old man model is. So these servers need large volume, they need space, they need power, enormous amount of electricity, huge amount of cooling that's required. Fluid carbon, you know, all those kind of things, liquid hydrogen, all that goes into that. We've got huge data management issues. The data that we are churning out is phenomenally large. It cannot be maintained and controlled onto single servers out here. So what we need, we need remote servers. We need servers where we can connect into, put in the information, hold it there, store it there for probably years together, right? So it's not the best way. It's not the most efficient way. Now, when we look at the efficiency, we're talking about a comparatively, when we say comparatively, it's in reference to blockchain. If we didn't have blockchain, I guess this would still be the best way out. But it's comparatively low, and there is a huge amount of scope of improvement for the old man model. So what do we do with the old man, typically? We take care of him, we improve from his experience, we learn from his experiences, we try to redefine the entire system and create something which is going to be beneficial for the future. So that's where the new kid on the block comes in, right? So that's blockchain. Now, when we say blockchain, uh, you've got a fair idea of what the old systems are. So let's look at what blockchain is and how typically it's going to be different from what we are, okay? It is, it was, rather, it is invented by Satoshi Nakamoto. Does anyone know about Satoshi Nakamoto? 
Okay, that's good. Talk. Can we hear it? Uh, so basically, it's a group of people. Um, they came up together and they created this. Uh, I think they're crypto graphers. They came up together and they created this whole blockchain um, as a you know means to improve from the pre-blockchain. Yeah. Anyone else? Satoshi Nakamoto. So you're saying he started with blockchain and the whole concept of Bitcoin. That's Satoshi Nakamoto. And his group. And his group. Okay. Does Satoshi Nakamoto really exist? No? Nobody knows? That's the right answer. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know whether Satoshi Nakamoto is actually a male, female, a group, an individual, or a company, or an organization, or a country, or whatever. We don't know. Satoshi Nakamoto, in the best manner, is supposedly a group of cryptographers who came up together they wanted to create something which is different they wanted to challenge the global currency methods so that was the main purpose of blockchain as created by satoshi nakamoto there are rumors there are theories abound on that some say it's illuminati some say it's whatever some say it's a japanese man unfortunately the real satoshi nakamoto who is there in japan was hounded by the media and he had to change his name legally because he's not the one who created blockchain. So Satoshi Nakamoto, we don't know at the moment, but the main purpose of creating the blockchain by Satoshi Nakamoto was to challenge the global currency and to create a system that's going to be more efficient. Right? So he, what he did when we say he invented, he really didn't create something out of the air. There was already a system in place. There were three different mechanisms in place. He just combined all three of them, created into a hybrid model, which is called as a blockchain. Right? So these three innovative concepts, or the three, sorry, the three old concepts were created and put forward in a very, very innovative manner. And that's what he really defined as a distributed ledger technology. He gave it a very fancy name called, or he or it gave it a fancy name called the blockchain. Right? So when you look at the Bitcoin, uh, as it says, it was an alternative to the global currencies. You'll be surprised that when it started in 2008, uh, Bitcoin, uh, the first Bitcoins were generated in 2009, and it was valued at six, six cents per coin. Right? That was the origin of Bitcoin. Early this year, the Bitcoin was valued at $18,000. So it's an exponential race in terms of the value of the entire Bitcoin. There were a lot of people who made money out of it. Many young kids, young entrepreneurs became billionaires overnight because of the Bitcoin. Right? The Bitcoin, towards the end of 2020, it is believed that it's going to touch a price of $20,000. It's believed. We don't know. We really don't know. It is believed. So we have to go by the speculation on that. Is Bitcoin here to stay? Pretty much. Is Bitcoin regulated by the governments? At the moment, not. Is it illegal? No, it's not illegal. Is it legal? Well, it's still not legal. So it depends because it is supposed to be a currency which the governments have not backed it, right? So we cannot say that it's legal or illegal. We can only say that it exists at the moment. That's typically where it stands. What's the idea of blockchain? Well, it was a decentralized database. When you say it's a decentralized, go back to the understanding that you've had of the servers. So all these servers are basically the central servers where information is sent in by the independent relevant computers. It goes on to the server. It stays on there. In this case, in blockchain, the whole premise of a server is removed. Every computer, every specific computer acts typically as its own server. So what it does, it becomes a node. We'll come to the node definition a little later, but that's what it is, right? So the whole idea is they remove the centralization part of the whole concept. It is a decentralized, more of a decontrolled, but a secure, extremely secure, and a speedy transaction. When we look at the speed, typically in the old man model, the speed of a transaction is about a second which means that you've got an aircraft flying above, the pilot needs to make a change or make a decision on the basis of certain information. So he 
queries into the database. The database reverts back to him with the information via a server. It takes about a second for this information. That's fantastic, right? But now we've got a some we've got a new system which is called blockchain, which actually does the whole transaction at one third of a second. So imagine that's what it's going to be. You've got a higher decision making speed. You've got more resources on hand. You've got the ability to really take a call pretty quickly and efficiently. Right? It's irrefutable. Anyone knows the meaning of irrefutable? When we send an email to someone, can we delete it? Can we delete an email? Right. We can delete the mail from a what you're saying is we can delete the mail from the personal box, but not from the server. Absolutely right. We cannot. But that's because the server keeps a copy of it. Right? So there is the control of your entire transaction now is with a third party. It's not with you. It's not with the recipient. So if you have sent a mail, which is there, it is going to be there for whatever millions of years together, as long as the database is there. Right? In blockchain, when we say irrefutable, what it means is, again, it, it simply means that the data cannot be deleted. It can only be appended. When we say appended, it can only be overwritten. It can only be changed to a certain extent, but the original data remains intact. So if you've got a money transaction and you want to trace the transaction of the money from A to B to C to D, well, it's right there on the system. And it happens pretty much in absolute rapid time, let's say one third of a second. So it's irrefutable. Provenance. Complete traceability. If when you apply this concept to something like a fresh fruit and you want to know where your watermelon is from, that's where the watermelon is going to give you the supply chain and tell you the provenance of it, that it was, it was originated in India, it flew by Emirates into Dubai, it was eaten by so-and-so person, or okay, we can't get to that data, but at least it was purchased by so-and-so person because that's your credit card information there. So everything is getting linked. Typically, so that's a provenance which tells you the origin of whatever the transaction is and will tell you the end of the culmination of the transaction. It's highly efficient. It triggers various levels of actions via something called as a smart contract. Does anyone have an idea of smart contract? No? Okay, what does the word smart contract typically mean to you? What would it mean to you? Something which is online, like it's not uh, handwritten something. Uh, kind of we are doing in stock exchanges like DMAT account kind. Uh, it's a dematerialized account in which uh, the two parties sign the things and uh, they have to be uh, done online. Okay, uh, like uh, we have stock brokers, so uh, before uh, opening any account, we need to have a DMAT account, which has to be built in with a bank, and it is a dematerialized account in which uh, uh, we have to uh, sign and contract with the investors, which we will going to invest our shares with it. Thank you. That's a nice one. All of you are well, most of you are students here. You get assignments from your teachers. You need to turn in your assignments. You get graded for the assignments. And eventually, all those grades are collected or collated together and put into what you call as an annual report card. That's a normal transaction. Now, let's say on a smart contract is where all this information is going into a particular system. Your grades, your assignment at each level is getting into a system Based on the ranking that you have received, you know, we define a smart contract. A smart contract typically means a programmed instruction. It is simple as that. It's a logic. It's the logic of the system. So the smart contract, which is built on certain different languages, we are defining the smart contract and saying that student A, student B, you know, they've got grades A star, both of them. Now, if they've got the A star, well, they earn from the Curtin University a credit for a cup of coffee which they can buy it at McDonald's or at Starbucks or whatever, right? So that's a smart contract. That's a set of rules that we've put into place. A smart contract is simply the set of rules in a programming logic, which is put into the blockchain and which is an autopilot thing in the sense that the smart contract, because it is smart, it kind of runs on its own as long as you've defined the rules absolutely clear and correct. 
So if you have made an error in defining of the rules, your smart contract is going to give you wrong end results, right? Okay, so mobile computing. In today's date, we are blessed with mobile phones. Basically, 15 years ago, we didn't have this luxury. In today's date, we have the ability to do a lot of computing right in the palm of our hands. Right? We can do transactions like banking, like shopping, like buying anything, having a ticket. Basically, that's our office. That's the start and the end of the entire journey. Let's put it this way. So, blockchain is something which is typically designed and is created in such a way that it is going to take into account the mobile computing. It is going to take into account the integration. The last point, if you see, using artificial intelligence, which is AI, using ML, which is machine language and which is also going to take into account IoT, which is Internet of Things. Now, these terms sound a little fancy, but what in reality they are, these are again logics that are applied on certain electronic devices, which can be a part of the smart contract process. So if you say that in the morning when I wake up at 6 o'clock, my smart contract is defined that my phone actually is connected via IoT and AI to my bedroom lights, and I say that 6 o'clock is my wake up time, switch off the lights, the smart contract will do that automatically whether you are up or not. It takes into account the time at six, it says this is the time stamp, it says we are done with the time, so it relays it via the IoT or the AI and connects to the machine and says that you know what, this is switch off time. Over a certain period of time when this particular set of transactions happens more frequently, that's when the high level definition of a machine language is formed. Right? I'm just trying to keep it as simple as possible. Okay. Highly secure. When we say highly secure, the blockchain at the moment kind of brags and boasts that it cannot be hacked. There is a reason for it. It cannot be hacked because most of the secure systems in today's day use what we call as a 64-bit uh, uh, or a 128-bit secure authorization, whereas blockchain uses what we call as a 256 hash, which means that any kind of information that goes in is actually coded on a 256-bit level. In terms of technology, that's phenomenal. In terms of basic layman understanding, just assume that it's unhackable at the moment. So the whole idea of blockchain, when Satoshi Nakamoto created it, was primarily to work on three simple parameters. And this is all that blockchain is all about. Okay? It's about security. When we say security, it's difficult to hack. It needs a global hacking to effect. When we say a global hacking to effect, it means that if a set of data or one particular part of the blockchain is hacked, then it has to affect the rest of the data. Now that doesn't happen. That literally doesn't happen. Right? So if you have to make a change in the entire system, so if there is someone who's trying to make a fraud or trying to come up with some sort of information and deceive. Let's say a student is trying to change the grades. Well, if he has to change the grades by hacking into the system, then he will have to change the assignment. That particular change in the grade would actually affect the next level of the connection of the grades, which is called the report card, which in turn will affect the university ahead. So it's a huge chain reaction that sets in. In short, it's absolutely difficult, not impossible, to hack in at the moment. Efficiency. In terms of efficiency, the whole idea of blockchain or the whole premise of blockchain is to remove the middleman. Have we, have we got an idea of what a middleman would look like in any of our normal day-to-day -day transactions? Anyone? Banks. Okay, he says banks. Anyone else? Yes, she says you have a middleman in the retail, which is the supply chain company. So let's take a transaction of, uh, let's say, a particular uh, court. If there's an issue, we go to the court. What happens then? Can we go to the court on our own? Theoretically, yes, we can. We have the right to go to the court on our own. But in effect, what we really need, we need a lawyer. We need a lawyer who understands the law, who goes on, presents our case to the judge who has never seen us before, and the judge on the basis of the information takes a call. Can this system be done? Can it be replicated via a blockchain? Do you think it is possible? Can we eliminate the middleman here? Who is the middleman here? Correct. 
can we eliminate the lawyer we can we can okay how many of you think we can eliminate the lawyer let's raise your hands up yeah that's few okay so the rest of you think we can't eliminate the lawyer well you'll be surprised that dubai court actually uses blockchain to take decisions Dubai has actually gone much ahead in terms of blockchain and uses the code for petty offenses. It is using the blockchain where they don't need a lawyer, where we do not need a lawyer. If there's a minor offense, it goes on to the system. There is an electronic system. The laws are in place. They define the offense. The police defines the offense. The offense is put onto the system. The system generates a particular fine or a penalty, and boom, that's it. We are done. All this transaction happens in practically an hour. what have they achieved with that well they have freed up the judges time to focus more on qualitative stuff they have allowed the police to do their job more efficiently so no more people waiting at the police stations no more issues happening and so on and so forth we'll come to the situation later right but what it does in terms of efficiency blockchain has the complete capability to reduce the middlemen as you rightly said the banks most of the banks in today's date are actually practically scared of letting go because the blockchains are replacing the middlemen the blockchains are replacing their entire requirement to be there but there are some banks who are smart who have decided to take the entire situation control it manage it and make it more effective one of them notably is emirates nbd so you'll see that in terms of blockchain there's a lot lot of focus in dubai and people are moving in that direction many of us are blissfully unaware as to what is really happening behind the scenes but we are actually in the blockchain we are part of the blockchain okay yes so it does remove the middleman it is basically not required the e-commerce model where we really go on to a souk.com or a noon.com and buy some stuff we don't need a store we are practically going through something which is online placing the order the order is directly placed on the vendor the vendor manufactures or has it in stock so this souk.com or noon.com typically doesn't even have an inventory on hand so what are they doing they're playing it smart what is applying here smart contracts it's smart logic okay speed as we said it's 1/3 of a second for the entire transaction now that's the beauty because why is this important we spoke about the pilots uh, case let's talk about it from a bank perspective you've got a sending money to b B needs the money. Typically, the current way of handling the money transaction between A and B is where A goes to the bank, puts in the paperwork, files in or shows in his identity card, what not, defines who the end receiver is going to be, and then the transaction happens. The earliest would be the next day. That's typically how it happens. Now, here in terms of blockchain, what's happening is all these transactions are happening pretty much rapidly in three seconds' time. So, money in at 10:30, three seconds. Money out. or received with the receiver at 10:30 6 seconds that's typically how fast it is now what that means in real terms is that your money is not tied up it's not being used by the bank it's not sitting doing nothing it's actually in use it's going to whoever needs it the most so what's behind the scenes in blockchain i mean we spoke about the 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 outer part of the blockchain the architecture of the blockchain but let's look at the brick and mortar what happens in the blockchain what is blockchain it's typically built on languages what is it built on some of the languages are python go solidity there are typically these are the current ones there are of course a lot of them but this is what the blockchain is built on we might have heard of languages or rather platforms like ethereum right or we might have heard of bitcoin all of these are still built on some sort of a software and the language in use here is one of these okay so behind the scenes in blockchain again it's a completely new method of recording transactions it's a digital method there is no physical paper required here it's completely digital it happens on its own in the system as defined by the logic and it records the transactions it's speedy extremely efficient low maintenance why is it low maintenance because in blockchain a we have completely removed the requirement of a server there is no server it's all going to be on individual computers which are called as the nodes or the peers right so there is no server here when there is no server we don't need the server space so basically your own laptop acts as its own server that really gives you the advantage of doing all the activities sitting in your bedroom right and it removes the requirement of huge space now when we talk about space i mean having a server in the desert of alain well that's cheap 
but having a server with needing a room practically in the middle of Emirates Towers, well, that's pretty expensive to host a server. So we have, we've kind of removed that with the help of the blockchain, right? It uses less computing, that's less power, less server space. It's secure and accurate. That's really the main point of blockchain, which is secure and accurate. So security, accuracy of data, that's really where blockchain is actually making the waves. Okay, these are, these are some of the key terms that, in terms of blockchain, which are going to be pretty much used very often. You know, by the end of this discussion, I don't expect you to be software engineers or blockchain experts, but you certainly should be aware of what are the key terms that are used in blockchain, right? So this is some of the terms that are pretty much in use. It's a peer-to-peer -peer network, nodes, cryptography, digital signature, hashing, consensus protocol, proof of work, proof of stake. Let's take a few out of this and go a little bit more in detail. So here what I've tried to do is pick up something which is very relevant, which you will probably understand more easily, and that's what it is, so a blockchain key term. So let's talk about P2P, a peer-to-peer. We spoke about the server being eradicated. So when we remove the server, what we really have here in place is A computer talking to a B computer directly. So we name the A computer and the B computer as peers. So all of you are students here. So basically all of you are peers to each other. You are equal, right? I'm equal with you as well because I'm a student too. So let's put it this way. So we're all peers. So a network between all of us is typically a peer-to-peer -peer network and that's really what blockchain. So we've completely removed the server maintenance out here, or the requirement of a server here. What does it do, the peer-to-peer -peer network? It's basically talking and interacting with the network, interacting with all the people involved in the network. Now, the network could be 10 people, 10,000 people, 10 million people, or more. Cryptography. What is cryptography? Cryptography is nothing new. It's been there probably for many, many centuries ago. People used secret codes. People used pigeons to transfer the codes. Then we had the World War II where you know, different methods of cryptography evolved. So basically, cryptography is nothing but it's a method of disguising and revealing. It's a method of masking and unmasking in simple terms, right? This is what cryptography is, and blockchain relies heavily on cryptography. What does it do? It is used for digital signature and validation. We'll come to the technical terms probably a little later. What's a node? Any electronic device which has an IP is a node. So our basic premise was that on the blockchain, we have a mobile phone, we have the bedroom lights, go back to that particular case, in which case your mobile phone is a node because it has actually got the IP on it and it's going to run the logic to switch off the bedroom lights or not. So your laptop, your mobile phone, your gaming console, anything can be a node, right? The node is the absolute foundation of blockchain. If there is no node, then the blockchain cannot function. So if there is no peer, the blockchain cannot have a discussion because there's nobody else to talk to. So it gives out what we call as a zero ping, right? So we've got hash. What is hash? Anyone knows hash? We have used the hashtags in Facebook, in Instagram, sorry? Hash codes. Hash is the, uh, in terms of blockchain, in terms of computing, hash is basically the conversion of input into a fixed cryptographic output. So when we say, um, when we do a hashtag blockchain, what does it do? It scans the entire system. Anything that has got a word blockchain in it, it will pick up and link it. Okay, this is not blockchain, but this is generally what hashing is about. But hash is very relevant to a blockchain. It's extremely important and critical in terms of a blockchain because hash defines the entire identity of the transaction. It defines the authorization of the transaction. It decides whether the transaction is valid, not valid, or has to be junked out, right? So what does Bitcoin use? Bitcoin uses an SHA-256 hash. It's a technical term. Look it up later. Most important part of a blockchain is the consensus protocol. What does the word consensus mean? Sorry? A common decision made, okay. Anybody else? An agreement. What else? Sorry? Consensus. Reaching the same condition, okay. 
Right. All three are absolutely correct. It's an agreement. It's agreeing to a certain condition. And it's basically deciding unanimously or in a certain vote manner where we're saying that five out of ten agree on something, right? So that's consensus protocol. A blockchain is absolutely invalid without a consensus protocol. Consensus is what we need to define. How do we define that? Where do we put up our consensus protocols? We spoke about that, smart contracts. How is the consensus mechanism? It works on a couple of concepts, which is called as proof of work, proof of stake, proof of elapsed time. There are various methods of consensus. Right, let's not go into the details of it, but consensus is an absolute mandatory element for any blockchain to sustain, survive, and execute and function. Smart contract, we already spoke about it. It's nothing but it's a self-executing contractual state. In simple words, it's a program with a set of instructions that functions and defines how and what is the output that is going to be. Okay, these are the simple terms. Okay. I use the word helicopter view. The helicopter view is something which is above the ground, but not far about, not too far above the ground. It's actually at a very medium level. You guys are all business students. Helicopter view is a common term that will be used in terms of your business studies down the line because that is just giving what we call as an elevator pitch. It's simply giving the outline of the project. So helicopter view is how a blockchain would look typically from an outline, uh, from an overview. We've got the old model, which is the centralized ledger model, which is where the bank, four clients talking to the bank, the bank controls the data, bank controls your money, bank decides everything practically. Bank decides whether you are you or not, if your identity documents are not in place, the KYC is what they call it. In the new model, distributed ledger, well, each of you is an independent entity. Each of you decide who you are. There are certain agreements in place. There are certain protocols in place. You've already submitted your KYC documents once. You don't need to do it every time you do a transaction. You just need to have your necessary protocols in place. So that's the helicopter view. All right, this is the interesting part, cryptocurrency. What's a cryptocurrency? Is it real? Anyone else? Is a cryptocurrency real? It only exists online, yes. Has anyone touched or felt it? Right, because it's not there in the physical form. It's an online thing. As it says, it's, it's a completely tradable digital asset. What do we mean by digital asset? It serves the function of being a currency. You can use the currency, you can use it to buy from an apple to an aircraft. That's absolutely possible, but you need to have the right relevant coin. So you need a person who holds the coin and you need a buyer who's willing to use that coin in return of goods or services. So cryptocurrency is a tradable digital asset which is purely online. Okay, It is the most important skeleton part of a blockchain. Cryptocurrency and how the currency is generated, it's a reward. It's a reward function. The reward function, just like how we work and we earn money, in the same way in a blockchain, you got to work and the system then generates its own cryptocurrency, which is defined. So Bitcoin, typically, is the output of a puzzle that's solved. It's a mathematical algorithm that's solved at some level. Uh, and you know the output of that is a Bitcoin, which is then certainly used as a tradable asset. What does the cryptographic securing and verification mean? It authenticates whether you are the rightful owners of that coin. It does not take into account how you have earned it. It is simply on the concept of whether you are the rightful owner of it or not. How you have earned it is a different ballgame altogether. Right? So it does the securing and the verification almost instantly. So no one else can use your money. Again, go back to the same principle that it's very difficult to hack in, but not impossible. It follows the basic principle of money. There is no difference in terms of the principles of what a money and a cryptocurrency is. So it is a currency. Let's take it this way, just that it's a digital currency. Crypto coins are further classed into bitcoins. We all know about bitcoins and there is altcoins. Altcoins are all the coins which are not bitcoins. That's typically how it is considered because bitcoin is supposedly a different league altogether. You've got altcoins and you've got tokens. What's the difference between a token and a currency? Can we use a currency to buy a burger in McDonald's and also buy a, a garment in maybe H&M? Sorry? 
So what about a token in that case? A token is issued, when, when is a token issued? You earn it as a result for something. Okay, so let's go back to the students who were doing the assignments and the grades. So when they turned in their assignments and they got graded, along with that they got tokens which they can use it at certain predefined places only. It's not a currency where it can be used universally or it can be used across the board. Right? So those are tokens. Why have the governments not yet regulated many coins? It's, it's common knowledge that the governments have not regulated many coins, but why have they not regulated many coins? Simple because the governments are not yet clear on how this works. It is in the infancy stage, there is a lot of work that's going on behind it, and while the regulations are being put into place, all the governments across the board, across the world, have to agree to a consensus. So the consensus is not yet reached. That's the reason why it is not regulated. There are other reasons too, but they don't belong here. We've got about 1,000 plus cryptos online as of now. You've got Bitcoin, Ripple, those are the most common well-known names, ETC, XLM, and so on and so forth. I mean, go on to Google and you would know which are the other coins. These are some of the cryptocurrency use cases. Um, when I spoke about the assignment and the universities uh, are actually using those, go on. So you're asking me if the Bitcoin can be exchanged. The Bitcoin can be exchanged. There are certain places where the Bitcoin is being ac accepted as exchange. We'll come to that later. I will. I'm almost at the end. Yeah. Right, so we need to move quick. So uh, these are the currency, the cryptocurrency use cases which are there. You've got a fitness app tied into the insurance. This is happening in the UAE. Pretty much, these are interoperable currencies that can be used for practically anything, which means that a Bitcoin can be used for buying a coffee or you know, vice versa kind of stuff. Um, UAE has got its own coin, which they're coming up with. It's called the M coin, the Emirati coin. It's still not in circulation, but they're getting there. These are the current areas of the use, or what we call the use cases. This is typically where blockchains are already being deployed. So blockchain is not new. These uh, particular industry domains or the verticals are, are pretty much in use of that and they have deployed a huge amount of infrastructure and financial resources. Okay, I'm going to skip this one and make it really quick on this. It's a blockchain use case. Now, when we were talking about a blockchain use case, can we really put in a blockchain into a real-term life? So let's, let's create a, some sort of a small use case and say that there were four guys who wanted to basically make a pizza. So they decided to agree on baking a pizza. They decided what the materials are going to be. And that's really what you know, they came up with and said, hey, you know what, let's, let's just get on with it. So they decided a currency called as a curtain coin in which they're going to trade or sell the pizza in a curtain coin. So the proof of work is each friend contributing material or some part of the work which is baking or cooking or chopping. That's the proof of work. That's what we spoke about the consensus thing. Then we're talking about smart contract where the rules are defined. So what has the rules defined between the four friends that all of them agree to make it as a chicken pizza, 10 slices. So those are the rules and sell it at 10 coins each, each slice. So, and then they all agreed that the friend number one is in charge of the delivery of the cake. So those are where your smart contract rules have been put into place. The logic has been defined. The transaction was done. The pizza is baked and ready now. That's where the transaction was done. How was it validated? Well, we had the oven temperature, which via the use of IoT, we confirmed that, okay, it went up to so and so degree. So that means that the pizza is done and ready. Then we did the sale. The pizza was sold at 10 coins per piece. What did we do there? We sold it. We got the transaction recorded in the coins and we had it verified. So what we did, we achieved the fintech part of it, the financial technology part of it. Then we had the receipt where the transfer of 10 coins is received into my bank or into my account, wherever it is. Verified, I paid the relevant taxes on that to the government and that's that. The regulatory technology part of it is achieved. The delivery of the pizza, somebody took the pizza, delivered it to the concerned guy and you know that's it. The supply chain part of it is achieved. Again, that's verified and put onto the blockchain. Now, all of this put together onto the blockchain achieved in probably a very, very, very short time. 
that's when we reach the consensus and that we said that the entire transaction from A to Z has been done, concluded, we have done the block. Now if this happens on each of the relevant slices, then that's why we created a blockchain of all the slices. These are the advantages of blockchain, which we all know, so I'm going to skip this out. Right. What is happening to blockchain in Dubai? Well, you guys are lucky to be in Dubai because Dubai is a city which is actually promoting blockchain in the largest manner. The whole world is looking at Dubai because they want to know what does Dubai come up with in terms of blockchain. What's happening? Well, the smart government initiative, they want to go paperless by 2020. How is that possible? Simply by the deployment of blockchain. So no more papers. That's already in place when we go in for the visa renewals and so on and so forth. You do it from the comforts of your home. You don't need much of papers. Just scan it, upload it once, and it's done. What does the Dubai government expect to achieve? Well, they will be saving 11 billion, uh, billion dirhams annually. Huge environmental impact. No more papers. Absolutely no more papers. So more trees, more green. Efficiency, 77 million work hours are saved annually, which means people have more time for families and fun. The happiness, that's the smiley part of it. Social media mapping, well, that's happening as we say. The social media is being used to write codes on blockchain and link it to your um, retail preferences, eating preferences, so on and so forth. We've got a health, which is DHA, and the fitness app, which is being tied up. What is happening here, which is very interesting, is that there is an app. Um, it could be Apple Health, it could be Fitbit, which is all linked to your insurance companies. The more you walk, the less premium you pay more healthy you are. That's actually being deployed in Dubai. It's very smart. Dubai quotes, we already spoke about it. It's pretty much in existence. In terms of Dubai, we are miles ahead in terms of blockchain as compared to the rest of the world. These are some of the companies which are the leaders of blockchain. Blockchain and universities, well, these are the universities which are pretty much extremely focused in terms of blockchain. And you will see that these are the who's who. What's the future of blockchain? Well, it's going to be in use in practically every situation in life ahead. So the faster you learn it, the better. It is what is going to be the revolutionizing of the internet. What was internet earlier, about 20 years ago, is what blockchain is going to be now. So the quicker you learn it, the better for all of us. Last point, as it says, higher efficiency, better profits, more happiness. How would this help for your future? All of you are high school students, and I'm sure you guys are going to go into different universities down the line. Your CV matters. In your CV, when you say that you have been participating in a blockchain event, or you have a knowledge of blockchain, well, I think you stand out. You definitely stand out over the rest of the others. It's a very easy to learn technology, absolutely no rocket science, very easy to build your own apps, just takes a fair understanding of the English language, use the syntax, little bit of logic and there you are. So that's what you're going to be the future business leaders. Well, what's next? You guys are business leaders of the future, so you need to think like one. If you would, you'll be surprised that some of the people in the blockchain industry are average age of 24 to 25 who are actually millionaires and billionaires right now because they just simply adapted to it. Focus on this specific opportunity where you are right now. This is an amazing thing. It's a, it's a blessing in a way. Uh, well, if you guys are serious about doing what you're doing, you need to get mentored. When I say mentored, it doesn't mean anything else. Just go back to your schools, talk to your teachers, talk to your IT guys, talk to whoever the people are and get yourself more knowledgeable. Take this opportunity to be very creative, you know, make mistakes bravely. We all did that. We all mess up at some point of time. Startups as a path because that's where the future is going to be and go for the BCC Cup. Simple as that. When I say that, all of you are participating. Well, that helps. That's really nice that all of you all are participating. But when you're going to be a winner, what you need is an attitude of winning, and that is really what is going to set you apart. So give it all your best for this particular cup. You are in an amazing place, great opportunity. Thanks to Curtin, make the best use of it, right? Okay, I expect no questions. Thank you very much for that. But if there are, you can always catch me a play.
Thank you so much. I hope you all enjoyed the lessons on blockchain. I think you got a real value today. You would have to spend a lot of time going through uh, the internet or going through MOOCs to get the kind of information that you got. So if we could have another round of applause for our speaker. So now the question is, what do you do with BCC and how do you participate? So all of you have the opportunity not only to participate but to win. This isn't about technical knowledge of blockchain. So if your background isn't IT and some of the more technical aspects today didn't make a whole lot of sense to you, that's fine. That was to help you understand a little bit how the technology works. But the thing that really matters is your creativity. So do you all feel like you're pretty creative? Are you all awake? Yes. <laughs> okay, so are you pretty creative? Yes. Okay, then you've got what it takes to be a winner here in the Business Cup Challenge. And the way this process is going to work is over the next three weeks, starting on this Thursday, I'll send out a business case to you. And you will spend a week working with your team and with your school mentor, your teacher, or your counselor, coming up with a creative solution to this business case. You do not need to go into technical details of blockchain. You need to understand conceptually what it can do. And some of the last slides we saw showed some great examples of what's being done here in Dubai with blockchain and some of the key industries that are really making use of it. What you will be doing is coming up with your response to the business case. And you can put this in any format that you would like to. Maybe you want to do a PowerPoint, maybe a Prezi, maybe you want to do a video, a Word document, doesn't matter. But there are some constraints. Okay, We've got over 100 teams participating. And when you turn in your response to the business case, Myself and my uh, senior faculty will have only the weekend to go through and give you all feedback and to rank them and put up a leaderboard. So because of that, we are asking that you limit your responses to not more than 2,000 words and you can include an appendix or an attachment of up to two pages of slides, uh, pictures, graphs, charts, anything of that nature. Okay, so you've got to keep the response concise. And you might think, well, that makes it more difficult. Yes, it does. It makes it more challenging. But when you get out into the world of business, that's what you're going to be asked to do. In the last talk, there was a mention of an elevator pitch. In an elevator pitch, you have to imagine that you've just gotten onto an elevator with maybe Bill Gates or Elon Musk, somebody who's got billions of dollars. You've got 60 seconds before the elevator reaches the floor that they're going to get off. You've got 60 seconds with one of the world's richest people to pitch an idea to them and get them to invest in it or at least invite you back for a more formal presentation so they can decide if they want to invest in it. So let me ask you this. If you got on an elevator today with Bill Gates, could you come up with a reason for him to give you some of his $100 billion? Could you tell him in 60 seconds? If not, it gives you something to work on. So part of the challenge here is to come up with a concise presentation of your idea so that you could pitch it to a VC or to an angel investor like Bill Gates. Okay, so three weeks, you'll get a business case, you'll work on it, you'll send the response back on the following Thursday. By that coming Sunday, you will have received feedback on your solution so that you can incorporate that feedback in your next week's case, and we'll post a leaderboard. Watch the leaderboard very carefully. 
the top eight teams on the leaderboard go straight through to the finals at the end of the three weeks. Okay, so ideally you want to be the top team on the leaderboard and keep yourself there. Now, when you're coming up with the solutions for these cases, what we're looking for is for you to come up with a way to utilize blockchain in order to either create or improve the business that you're writing about in your case. And what you will need to do is to put together basically a business plan. What is your idea? What is the concept that you'll have the business doing? And then how will it actually make money? So if you think of a business, they exist to make money. If you can't monetize your idea, you could be like so many of the internet startups. Now, you're too young to remember this, but I remember when the internet first became a thing, or actually the World Wide Web first became a thing, there was a company that came up with this idea of we're going to pay people to surf the internet. Okay, so you would use their browser extension and you would log in and you'd start surfing the internet. And the longer you surf the internet, the more money you made. And there were some people who were actually making thousands of dollars a month doing nothing but sitting around and surfing the internet. There were some other people I know who came up with a little script that ran on their computer that just went through and surfed the internet by itself so they could be off doing other things. And some of them set up dozens of computers all surfing the internet and making thousands of dollars a month. Now, what's the problem with a business like that? How does it make money, right? I'm paying you to surf the internet. How do I make money out of that? And if you look back in the early 2000s, there were lots and lots of businesses that burned through literally billions of dollars of venture capital money and went out of business because they didn't have a real business model. So when you do your response to the cases that we send out, you've got to have a business model. So we're going to expect to see that you will have figured out a way to monetize the use of blockchain in that business, that you will show financial projections so we can see where's your break-even point. How many customers or how many participants do you have to have in your blockchain in order to actually be making money? We expect you to also look into the environmental aspects, the political, the economic, the social, the technical, the environmental, the legal pestle analysis, right? Going through and figuring out what impacts might happen. So for example, if you started up Bitcoin, well, from a political standpoint, governments around the world have decided they don't like Bitcoin because they don't want any competition in the world of fairy tale money, right? Because every government creates its own money and none of it is backed by anything real. It's only valuable because we all decided it was valuable. Well, here comes Bitcoin and we all decide it's valuable, but there's no government that controls that. They don't like the competition. So there are governments around the world that have actually banned the use of Bitcoin or other types of cryptocurrency within their country. Good luck with that. You know, how do you ban something when people want to exchange and are willing to exchange? But they're trying to. So you need to think about political, legal, economic, social, technological, and environmental challenges and address those if they're applicable to your solution. You also need to consider competitors. When Bitcoin started, it was the only cryptocurrency. As you saw in the presentation, there are well over a thousand cryptocurrencies. 
And in fact, if you want to create a cryptocurrency, there are little apps you can use online that will create one in about five minutes. Okay, so when you're coming up with your solution, you also need to consider competition. Who's already playing in that space? And if people aren't playing in that space, how easy would it be for somebody else to step in and take your idea and beat you with it? Because there are a lot of businesses that have come up with great ideas that got beat at their own game. How many of you, uh, you you're all carrying your phones, right? How many of you have a Palm Pilot or a Palm Trio? You're going, a what? It's the first smartphone. Okay, the Palm Trio was an internet connected phone where you could share calendars and emails and there were even some very rudimentary mapping applications. None of you have ever heard of Palm because other people came in and did it better. In particular, Apple, when they came out with the iPhone and sort of revolutionized it. Okay, so you need to think about that when you're coming up with your solution. If you come up with a good solution, who's likely to try and step in and eat your lunch? And how will you deal with that? Does that make sense? Okay, so that's the first three weeks. Now, at the end of the first three weeks, if you're not in the top eight on the leaderboard, does that mean that you're out of the competition or that you can't win? Not at all, okay? For the fourth week, we'll send out two things. There will be a normal business case, like you've been getting previously, and there will be an elevator pitch case. So if you're not in the top eight, you need to prep both of them. So the business case, you'll prep as you normally would, but you'll need to think about it in terms of presenting it live, because 10 teams will be presenting their solution to the last business case live on stage at the finals. And in doing that, you can be as creative as you want to. Maybe it's PowerPoint, Prezi, maybe you make a video, maybe you get up and act it out as Shakespearean actors. Be creative, let me see what you've got, okay? So, but if you're not in the top eight, how do you get to be in those last two slots? Well, that's where the elevator pitch comes in. You'll prepare a 40 second elevator pitch and we actually will watch the time very carefully. At the final, every team that's not in the top eight will get 40 seconds to get up on stage and present their elevator pitch to the judges. At the end of that, the best elevator pitch will go on to the final. That team will go on to the final. And then the judges will do a judge's choice. They'll pick one more team to go on to the final based on something that set that team apart. Maybe it's the team that's most improved from the first case. Maybe it's the team that came up with the most creative way of doing their elevator pitch. We won't know until the day. Okay, so figure out a way to distinguish yourself, to set your team apart. And then those final 10 teams will go on and will present. When you're doing your presentation, 10 minutes, okay, and again, we'll watch the time very carefully. So you need to practice your presentation and make sure that you can get it done in 10 minutes or less. Because at 10 minutes, the buzzer goes off and you have to stop wherever you are. That makes sense? Okay. So remember, there are going to be three hard deadlines or constraints you have to deal with. When you do your responses to the first three cases, not more than 2,000 words and two pages of charts, graphs, pictures. Okay, if you go over that, you actually lose points. When you do the elevator pitch, 40 seconds, not a second more, okay? So maybe time it to about 38 seconds just so you've got a buffer. And then for the final presentation, 10 minutes, not more. Does that make sense? Okay, so any questions about what you need to do? Yes, ma'am.
Okay, uh, so for the eight teams that are at the top of the leaderboard, you don't have to do the elevator pitch. It's only for the other hundred or so teams to have a chance to make it to the final. So on that last day, everybody still has a chance. Any other questions? Sir. Uh, yeah, so the question is, can you make a video to present your idea? Absolutely. So if you're making a video for one of the first three cases, not more than five minutes, okay? If you're making a video for presenting the final case, again, not more than 10 minutes. Sir. Uh, the submission uh, for the case studies is online, uh, except for the final, where we'll uh, be at a venue for the final. Sir? Um, so the question is, could you develop something like a mobile app? If you want to spend the time to put together a demo or some physical thing like that, that's fine. but that in and of itself won't necessarily get you more points, okay? So if you're going to do it, do it well, okay? Because you don't want to do something creative and do it badly because that doesn't help. Any other questions? Sir. Uh, okay, so the question is the uh, teams that are at the top of the leaderboard, those top eight teams, do they have an advantage going into the final? Nope. Okay, at the final, other than the fact you won't have to do an elevator pitch, everybody starts from zero with those last 10 teams. So the best presentations in the final get first, second, and third places. Anything else? Okay, great, I thank you so much. And let me see by a show of hands, which school is going to win the BCC? I hope everybody puts their hands up, okay? <laughs> Very good. Uh, so looking forward to seeing all of you competing. If you have any questions uh, going forward, uh, Mr. Sally Ismail, who is our head of IT, will be here to answer any further questions. Oh, okay, so the rewards. Uh, we're still working out the final rewards with our uh, sponsors, but I'll give you some examples from prior uh, events. Uh, previous Business Cup challenges, we had uh, each member of the winning team got a 1,000 Durham um, uh, national bond from UAE national bonds. Of course, uh, the winners also uh, automatically get scholarships. So the winning team gets a 50% scholarship uh, for any uh, undergraduate program here at Curtin Dubai, second team 35% and the uh, third team 20%. So it's a great way to help pay for your university. And there will be other prizes as our sponsors uh, make their final commitments. Uh, so we'll be sending out notice as each sponsor comes on board. <laughs> uh, yeah, we do recognize the teachers as well. So you've got a surprise coming. Okay, sir. Oh, okay. He was just pointing at the ceiling. No worries. Thank you so much, and look forward to seeing all of you on the uh, stage on the final day. All the best. Thank you, guys. In case if anybody else has any other queries, please write to us. You have our um, email address. It's bcc at curtindubai.ac.ae. Some of you may also have uh, my email address or the team members' email addresses. Feel free to network with us um, once we are out of this room. And also for the teams that haven't provided their individual email addresses and phone numbers, please do so. That's very, very important for us so that we can reach you all on time. Thank you. <laughs>